Own Your Truth with life strategist Laura T. Real advice for regular people. Now, here's Laura. Hello and welcome to Own Your Truth, where we're talking real advice for regular people. I'm Laura T. Thank you so much for listening. I know there's lots of ways you can spend your time, and I'm grateful you're going to spend the next hour with me. Okay, so so we're going to talk about behavior and how understanding it can really lock the key to motivation. Before we get talking about understanding um, behavior, we want to look at motivation and really have a common understanding of motivation. Let me ask you, have you ever attended a workshop or been left all fired up, ready to take big action, but then you got home or you got back to the office and the daily stressors of life set in, right? You found it yourself quickly back to responding to the day's challenges. And the idea of creating something new or implementing your big plan gets put on the list of things to do, and you know that list is endless. Well, typically what happens is after a couple of weeks or even a couple months, that big plan, that big goal gets pushed so far down on the list, it gets removed. If you can relate to this, you're not alone. So when we think about motivation, we often look for it from, the out, from outside of ourselves, We are externally motivated by a movie we saw, or a book we read, or a training we attended. But the reality is, and statistics support, external motivation doesn't last. And the longer we wait to act on something, the less likely we are to take action on it. This is called the law of diminishing intent. And we've all experienced it at some point in our lives. This is why it's so important that we've got to understand ourselves so that we don't have to look to those external forces to help keep us motivated. What I've discovered in coaching is that people often need the greatest motivation when they're doing things they've been told they should do, right? I have my air quotes around what should. They're not doing the things that are natural for them or the things they really want to do. Let me give you an example. When I first started coaching, I worked in a real estate office, and the broker often complained, you know, like, realtors had these big goals, but they weren't doing what it took to reach their goals. Well, so at this particular office, they used an assessment to help guide people to the area of real estate that best suited them. But once people got into their role, the assessment was never referenced again. It was put into a drawer and nobody looked at it. Well, I'd become a little bit obsessed with the tool, so I started to study how to use it. Well, after month after month where the broker was complaining, I said, well, give me some of the agent's assessment results. Let me take a look. Let me see if there's anything there. And I I use one agent as an example. You know, her greatest fear was rejection, right? And the company we were at focused heavily on cold calls and go for no and push past the pain. Well, that wasn't going to work for this person long term. Yes, they had had a history of momentary motivation, but the results were short term. They were forcing themselves to do work that was totally unnatural for them. They could only keep themselves motivated for a short period of time, and eventually they ran out of steam. As a result, their business was a crazy roller coaster with lots of ups and downs. It wasn't something they could felt they felt they could rely on. Now, being in real estate for 10 plus years, I love the business. And obviously, there are lots of ways you can build a strong, long lasting business that doesn't involve cold calls. But what people weren't thinking about is what's natural for me. We hear people in authority telling us how it should be done. And we think, oh, okay, you want to follow the people that are doing great. But doing that doesn't always work when the people that you're following don't have a similar behavior to you. So until we understand what's natural for us, we're guessing. And we often waste a lot of time on efforts that aren't sustainable. So stop thinking about that one-size-fits-all method that we're typically taught and really start to think about what works best for you. Because when I talk about motivation tonight, it's really about unlocking your natural gifts. I'm going to say that again because... Unlocking your natural gifts is really a key. You're going to notice I didn't say strengths, right? I know a very popular go-to for understanding someone's talents is a book called Strength Finder. 
It's a really good resource developed and distributed by the Gallup organization. And it's a quality tool. The challenge is when we use a word like strength, if we're not strong in that area, we assume that it's a weakness, which isn't really the case. There are so many things we can do and be fine at, but do you want to use your energy on being fine or good? Again, my air quotes. Or would you rather focus on natural gifts to be great? When we're not working within our natural gifts, we're reducing our ability to create momentum. And ultimately, that's the cause of us losing motivation. So my goal is to remove that judgment that goes along with how we show up, right? So strengths, weaknesses, good, bad, we want to get rid of all that. When I talk about behavior, it's with a focus on energy. When we're being our most natural, it takes less energy. When you have to adapt your behavior, it takes more energy. This is not about strengths and weaknesses, right? It's about how much energy do you want to exert? So a typical question I get asked is, how do you know what's natural and less natural? Well, there are a number of assessments out there. I'm going to talk about one tonight in a, little, in a few minutes. But um, I think it's important to note that when we look at assessments, each one can be helpful in its own way. And it's important to know that no, there's not one assessment out there that's going to tell the whole story of a person, right? I heard an analogy I thought was so powerful. Um, someone had said, if you look at understanding ourselves and we reference a Rubik's Cube, you remember that like 80s game, I think it's made a comeback where you've got the, you know, different color squares and they make up, you know, the top of the game and each side has a different color. Well, if we think about ourselves as the top of the Rubik's Cube and you think about each one of those little boxes being a part of us, right? One part would be an assessment or a characteristic. Another part would be um, uh, our gender. Another part could be our background. One square could be our education, right? So we could put the disc, which is the assessment I use, on one square. You could put Myers-Briggs, another assessment, on another square. You could put String Finder on another square. Each one of those squares makes up our whole, and each one plays a role. So tonight, I'm going to reference DISC, which is the assessment I use. Even with this tool, I, and I find it to be highly accurate. It's important to know it doesn't have any meaning until we give it meaning. So the most important part of any assessment is debriefing it with someone who's qualified to go through it with you. Tonight, we're just going to talk about some general characteristics, and you're kind of going to guess where you are. But if you're taking an online assessment, it's really important that you're not looking at the results and making judgments about yourself based on what you're reading. Because a qualified debriefer is really important to ask you about how the results show up in your life and make sure that you understand sometimes the assessments have a different meaning than the meaning that we give it sort of in general English language, right? So you want to, if you're taking assessments, again, they're great. They can prove very helpful. You want to put them in context and you want to be asking yourself questions about what they mean and how it shows up. A brief overview of the assessment I use, which is called the DISC, so that we can begin to talk about its influence on motivation. So if you have your piece of paper, you want to kind of take some notes. And the best way to do this is to create um, a graph on your piece of paper so that in on the left-hand side, you have DISC, which is D in one box, I in another, S in another, and C in the final box. And then I'm going to give you description of, uh, descriptions of each. If you miss any of this, I will post a link to the DISC. I call it a cheat sheet on um, the Own Your Truth with Laura T Facebook page so that you have, to, have it to reference afterward. Okay. So when we look at D, D is how you relate to challenge. And when we look at people who are um, who lead with that dimension, they tend to be very outgoing and very direct. They're decisive and forceful. It's important to know that they're task-orientated individuals and they're very fast-paced. They make decisions fast. They like to talk fast. Um, their greatest fear is being taken advantage of. And some of the ways to help them keep momentum is to offer – it's getting things done. They like to make quick decisions. They thrive when they're in an environment like that.
Something I also like to mention is when we look at the United States and the percentage of people that fall into each of these categories, 18 percent of the U.S. population falls into that leading driver category. It's important to know that when we look at our assessments, we are really a combination of all four of these dimensions, that D, I, S, and C, um, but we tend to lead with one, two, or three. Okay. Let's talk about the second dimension, which is influencer. This is how you relate to people and contacts. Um, these people tend to be really outgoing and talkative, very enthusiastic, enthusiastic and expressive. Um, their main focus is on people. They are also very fast-paced. They like to get things done fast. They make fast decisions. Their greatest fear is loss of social recognition. And when you think about keeping up momentum, they tend to keep up, momen up momentum when working with optimistic people, people who look at the bright side and being on a team. Then we have steadiness, our third dimension. This is about pace and consistency. People who lead with the steadiness dimension, they're reserved, they're reliable, modest, and methodical. They also have a very strong relationship with people. They're slower paced. They're more internal. They, they think a lot about things. Their greatest fear is losing security. And to help them keep momentum, things like routine and long-term planning are really helpful. And then we look at compliance. This is our final dimension. This is how someone relates to um, rules and regulations or even constraints. These individuals are reserved, very analytical and exacting, tend to be very conservative in terms of how they think and the actions they take. They're not risk takers. Their activities are very task oriented. Their pace is very slow. Their greatest fear is making mistakes. And some ways to help them keep momentum is to give them proof and additional information. And I just realized I forgot to share the different uh, percentages. So if we look at, remember I mentioned people who lead with driver, about 18% of the U.S. population. People who lead with influencer are about approximately 34% of the population. People who lead with steadiness make up 32% of the population. And people who lead with compliance make up approximately 16% of the population. And so I share that with you because as we're interacting with other people and we're even thinking about ourselves, we can start to understand what motivates others while we're figuring out what motivates ourselves. And so in looking at these four dimensions and understanding where we fall, really helps us start to see the things that are going to be natural for us. So, for instance, if you're a leading influencer or steadiness, things related to people are going to be – you're going to be naturally drawn to. Often we know internally, intrinsically what we like and what we don't like, but we're so influenced by the information that comes at us. We second-guess ourselves and we change our minds. But when we look at what's natural and we stay true to who we are – we have the ability to not only be more easily motivated, but make better decisions for ourselves. So let's talk about some times when you aren't motivated and you can't figure out why. Well, so if you lead with driver, and remember, you're task oriented and direct, and your goal is to manage a big project with lots of subordinates, well, it's not likely you're going to be motivated to carefully explain to them what needs to be done. Now, obviously, you need them to do the work, but it's not going to be natural for you to take that extra time to explain the details. And so often when things aren't natural, we put them off or we wait or um, in some cases, in, in some cases, great, we leverage them to other people. In some cases, not so great, we leverage them to other people. It's important to understand what naturally motivates us. If you lead with influence and you're enthusiastic and optimistic and your goal is to better manage your kids' behavior, well, as a parent, it's less likely you're going to be motivated to enforce the rules, even though things at home feel like they're chaos. But when you're so people oriented, you don't want to be seen as the bad guy. And so it's harder to enforce those rules. If you lead with steadiness and you're modest and loyal and reliable and your goal is to grow your own um, – to grow in your position both financially and 
in your title? Well, it's hard to be motivated to ask for that raise if you think your boss may disagree or question you. It'll feel like there's confrontation and that's going to have you feel uncomfortable. So again, you can see how what's natural for us has us play in both what's motivating and also what's demotivating. If you lead with compliance and you tend to focus on the details and you're more task orientated and your goal is to get promoted, well, it's hard to be motivated to take that next step in your career because a leadership role could involve managing people and focusing on the big picture. And that's not how you think naturally. And it can feel overwhelming to consider change. So I give these examples because it can often feel like our behavior is in direct conflict with our motivation to achieve our goals, which can leave us feeling exhausted physically, emotionally, and intellectually. The truth is sometimes our behavior is in direct conflict with our goals. And sometimes we've got to adjust our goals. But more often, we can use this conflict to find a better way. So we had a short little excerpt here now. We're going to actually talk – we're going to listen to this week's Musical Artist of the Week because the next section's section's a little bit ro- more robust and it's going to take up more time. So after the Musical Artist of the Week, we're going to talk about how to use behavior to understand it, behavior and get – Pardon me. We're going to talk to about how to use behavior to understand and gain motivation and momentum. So we talked about ways that behavior can be demotivating. Next, we're going to talk about ways that it can motivate us and we can gain momentum. Right now, we're going to focus on Own Your Truth Musical Artist of the Week, Billy Ruger. About Billy, he was born into a musical family and began his formal musical training at the age of 12. He knew even at a young age he wanted to study music and ultimately went to college at the New School of Jazz and Contemporary Music in New York City, where he studied and performed with some of the most acclaimed jazz musicians in the world. Billy currently resides in Fairfield, Connecticut, performing locally as a solo act and nationally with Mystic Bowie's Talking Dreads. Here is Billy Ruger performing his original song, Chasing Rainbows. On a small, dead-end street Where everything I need was laid at my feet I looked up to the sky Something beautiful had caught my eye And I couldn't resist the temptation To embark on a new exploration And the tears, they fell as I bid farewell to the I was leaving behind But now I'm back Where I started Couldn't get Where I wanted All my searching Was in vain Looking through the eyes of a child Playing pretend Chasing rainbows Chasing rainbows It's not fair though Cause I'm just Time. And I don't want to die But I fear my life is passing me by So I dream, dream of ways That I'll try to spend the rest of my days No more doubts in the back of my mind No one there who would treat me unkind And I did quite well to come Myself that I'd finally left the darkness behind But now I'm back where I started Couldn't get where I wanted All my searching was in vain Looking through the eyes of a child Playing pretend Every rainbow I find Through the 
eyes of a child playing pretend. Let's talk about understanding behavior. And before the break, I mentioned we're going to talk about how to use behavioral understanding to gain momentum and motivation. So when we think about maintaining motivation, I often use the term keeping up momentum interchangeably because we can't afford the starts and stops of doing things that are less natural for us. The ideal is to keep unnatural tasks, interactions, situations to a minimum of about 20% of your time. So you can spend 80% of your time in the areas that are more natural for you. Now, of course, this sounds simple, but we know that it's not that easy to do. And so what I'm going to do is challenge you to keep a time inventory. I have a sheet on my website that I'm going to share on the Own Your Truth with Laura T. Facebook page, or you can just use an Excel spreadsheet. But it's really important to look at where you spend your time. And as you go through this process, don't judge it. Just record it and see. It's so often that we are doing things that are unnatural, and because they're a part of our daily habit, we don't even recognize we're doing it. And, you know, I think about this and and how sad it is because I often connect it to what I see happening in the workplace. 67% of the U.S. working population is disengaged or actively disengaged in their work. So what does that mean? That means basically they're either showing up and doing the bare minimum or they're showing up and just punching the clock. Of course, we don't have time clocks anymore, but literally they're not doing their job. They're just showing up, being there, doing whatever it is to fill their day and then going home. Given the number of people I talk to each year, it's easy to see that there's a connection between job satisfaction and behavior. People are less motivated to do jobs that aren't natural for them. And so don't get me wrong. Obviously, there are always things involved in our work, in business, and even at home that we do and we don't like to do. And of course, they have to get done. So the key is knowing how, can, how to keep motivated by creating the balance. You know, I think... Again, we go back to this notion that it's so easy to know what's natural for us. Um, We feel it. We often are drawn to it. If you want to look at um, what you're naturally drawn to, look at where you spend your time when you're outside of work. Where do you spend your time? What are your hobbies? Those are the things that you're naturally drawn to. Even go as far as to make a list of the characteristics of the things that you're naturally drawn to. You're going to see some commonalities. Again, we the things that are natural for us happen easily. We get into that flow. Um, it's as if time stands still. We can get so much done because we're in flow. It, things just happen easily. And so what I want to do now is talk about ways to create balance when we're stuck doing something we don't want to do or when we're not feeling that flow. Again, I think it's easier to find the places that we're in flow than it is to find ways to get out of the things where we feel like we're less in flow. So my number one suggestion is to leverage others. And I'm going to give you some examples with these. So if you don't like the minutia or you stink at administrative work or bookkeeping makes you want to tear your hair out 
or the thought of doing your taxes is l- more painful than ripping your eyeball out with a spoon, which is actually the expression that I use when doing my taxes, that <laughs> welcome to my world, right? So you have to understand, my husband is one of those overachiever tax people. He gets our taxes done early. He provides all the support materials. He dots all his I's and he crosses all his T's. I mean, this is natural for him. He claims he doesn't like doing it, but the way that he does it says that's very natural for him. I mean, one year our accountant said she wished all of her clients were as organized as my husband. So for years, I would set aside an entire weekend to do my taxes. It was painful for me and actually for my entire family. It was mentally and physically exhausting to go through this exercise. But I just thought, like, this is my responsibility. I've been in business for myself. I need to go through and do my taxes. And even though my husband would offer to do them for me, I just felt like this is my responsibility. Then one year, it like hit me like a lightning bolt, right? Why am I doing this? Why not let him do this because, number one, he's faster. He'll probably do it with more accuracy. And I let my ego get in the way of having him help me with this. If I let him to do my taxes, I could use my energy in more productive ways. So the first suggestion I have for people is to ask yourself, when you're doing things that aren't natural for you, is there anyone else who could do it? Now, it's important to note that I'm not saying, is there anyone else who's available to do it? Is there anyone else who it would be easier for? Because once we start to put those limits, we start crossing off people. Just open-ended question first time around. Is there anyone else who could do it? If the answer is yes, then ask them. Let them be the one who says no, right? Because if the task isn't natural for you, find someone else who will do it who it's more natural for so that you can focus your energies on things that fill you up, that serve you. Okay, so my second suggestion, when you're feeling stuck and you're doing things that aren't natural for you, is to find ways to manage your energy. Because sometimes the things that we're doing aren't natural, but we wanna be doing them anyway. So in this case, um, the idea of filling yourself up first before after a task is complete. So the example I use, I have a client who really wanted to be a speaker and a trainer. Well, based on his behavioral style, it wasn't natural for him to be on, right? I have my air quotes, on in terms of the energy and being with people. And um, it just, he needed time to, to rest and rejuvenate. So with this, he was actually disappointed as we were going through his assessment. But the key to understanding behavior is that your behavior doesn't, limit your ability to do anything. It simply impacts your energy and ultimately your motivation. Now, he had other things beside behavior, right? We kind of go back to that Rubik's Cube and some other pieces on his Rubik's Cube that had him more motivated to be a trainer and speaker, um, that he was willing to find ways to overcome this energy depletion that happened when he was around a lot of people. So, One of the things we did with him is we really looked at how much energy it would take for him to be in the spotlight. We created a plan to help him build his tribe online so it didn't require that direct contact. It also allowed him to determine what went out and when. He decided to ultimately host large group events where he could control the, uh, the content and showcase his skills, right? All of this helped him conserve his energy. It also allowed him to be seen as the expert. What he also decided to do was limit those smaller events and one-on-one time so that he could focus only on those that gave a big return because those tend to consume a lot of energy. The key was to find a balance. So he buffered his schedule before and after events for me time to rest and recover. And so one of the other things you can do when you find that you're in a space where you have to perform or do something that's less natural, really look at managing your energy. What do you have to do to fill yourself up first so that you can give to others? And then what do you have to do to refill afterward? These are some ways that we can get through doing those things that are less natural. 
The final suggestion I have is to make your plan. I find most often when I'm working with people who aren't achieving their goals because they're not motivated is that the plan or the goal was never theirs. Often we do things that aren't natural for us because we're being influenced externally, sometimes by well-intentioned people, sometimes by circumstances that come our way. But mostly they have us question ourselves or they force us to work in unnatural states. And doing this short term is fine. What we want to make sure we don't do is stay in a constant position where we're adapting or we're unnatural. Remember, that's going to take a lot of energy. The truth is, if you don't make a plan, you're living someone else out someone else's plan. I'm going to repeat that. If you don't make a plan, you are living out someone else's plan. So it's so important to understand your natural behavior, what gets you in that flow, and then make a plan to live that way. Otherwise, you're put into these positions where you're living out someone else's plan or expectations. You know, sadly, I see this about 40% of the time when I'm assessing high school and college age students. You know, sometimes they're participating in a sport or they're studying a subject or going to a school because a a coach, a parent or a mentor told them that's what they should do. Right. I have my air quotes or should do. Often, We parent based on our behavioral style instead of our kids. So we think what worked for us will work for them. And that's hardly ever the case. I've also seen a huge push for parents um, to have students go to college to get a good job or maintain a lifestyle rather than studying something that they're interested in or passionate about. And what we know is with a strong influence from an authority, it's easy to question what we intuitively feel is best for us. And so I started talking about students, and yet we see this in the workplace as well. You know, there's someone skilled at their job and admired by their boss. Automatically, they're moved up to management without proper training for their behavioral style. And th- Without that training, they're not able to do a good job. They feel badly about themselves. They become demotivated. It's really important to remember your behavioral style, and I said this before, your behavioral style doesn't prevent you from doing anything, but it does impact your motivation into desire to do certain things. So, you know, Another example would be, even if you're on a, uh, I I see this all the time, sales projections or project plans that are made arbitrarily by leadership, um, people do things for their reasons, not yours. If people who, if people had ultimately, who are ultimately fulfilling the plan had a say in its creation, then they're on board. But when you create a plan and pass it down, you've already demotivated 80 to 90 percent of your workforce. If you're lucky, there's about 10 to 20 percent that will follow through regardless because they're pushed past the pain, they're do the work. But the long-term impact will absolutely show up in your employee satisfaction reports. The bottom line is understand your behavior so you know what's natural And you can create a balance when you're in a position where it's less natural. You know, I found in debriefing thousands of assessments with people that I'm not sharing anything new or anything that people don't already know about themselves. I really just give words to the feelings people have about themselves but don't have the language and therefore the confidence to share with others. It's important to recognize being focused on energy and what's natural isn't the norm in the U.S. So there tend to be challenges associated with waiting for or finding what's natural. And I, I, the examples I'm going to use, I find this so much when people are looking to change their career or even move up in the next level or for people who are out of work. Because waiting for what we want or what we know is a good fit isn't what society tells us to do. I mean, think about the whole job interview process. We go into the process wanting to be chosen instead of thinking, are we really a good match? Is this a natural place for me to work? Are the employees, is my manager someone who's natural for me to work with? So what happens when we're faced with these challenges? Well, 
the number one thing that happens is we begin to doubt ourselves. I have a client who knew she'd outgrown her current firm and despite being a partner, wasn't sure if she was good enough to move to someplace larger. She doubted her own ability. Well, she did move and she's thriving in the larger environment. But it's not natural for us to wait. We get questioned. Another thing is we don't realize that in waiting for what's natural, it doesn't always happen on our timeline. I have a client after being promoted at his company, his entire division was let go due to restructuring. He knew what he wanted. It was crystal clear. We'd worked on it for a while. But after months of not working and despite lots and lots of job interviews and even a couple of job offers, he waited. He and he started to get frustrated. Well, after 18 months, he landed his ideal job in one of the country's leading tech companies doing exactly what he's dreamt about doing. Now, I can already hear people saying, well, that's nice, but I don't have the luxury of 18 months without work. Well, neither did he. He got resourceful. He started consulting to make ends meet. And as a result of that consulting job, he landed his ultimate dream job. So we don't always realize – we don't realize it doesn't happen on our, ti- on our timeline. But don't question it when you know what's right for you. And then the final thing is often well-intentioned people in our lives believe they know better. And those who love us most think they know what's best for us. But unless they're asking us the questions and not telling us what to do, which is kind of what happens most often, um, they don't know what's best for us. So it can be hard to shut out the voices around you when you're surrounded with people who don't understand this idea of waiting for what's natural. And so some suggestions I would make is, you know, find people who do support that focus. Make efforts to meet with them and fill yourself up with materials that support what you want. You've got to find ways to stay motivated when there's doubt around you. So... There is kind of a lot of different information here about understanding your behavior, understanding who you are, then looking at how to overcome all of the challenges that we're faced when we're in positions of not working in areas that are natural for us. And I hope that you found it really helpful. We have some time for some questions. And while we wait for your calls, I will answer some of the questions that we've gotten from the Own Your Truth with Laura T. Facebook page. Okay, Tony from Monroe asks, um, so much of corporate training talks about working on weaknesses. It's almost second nature to think you have to adapt. What do you do when you're in a situation and realize you're adapting and not being natural? That's such a great question. And, you know, it's so interesting. I I love that this question focuses on um, not being natural in terms of communication and working with other people. So, First and foremost, um, I always say that when we're working with other people, you want to kind of rein yourself back in, right? So if you're noticing in the moment that you're adapting, it's important to ask yourself, what would it take to be more natural here? Um, Oftentimes, people will withhold comments, withhold suggestions because they think it's not their place or it's not um, the perfect time or this doesn't fit here or, you know, as you're saying, it doesn't, it doesn't, I would have to adapt in order to make a comment. It's really important that you stay true to you and it's finding a way to make your comments so they can hear you. I always say I don't adapt who I am. I will sometimes adapt my language so that people will hear me. And the difference is toning it down. I have a very direct, um, energetic personality. And so when I'm working with clients who are a little bit more slower paced, I want to turn it down and I want to use language that they can connect with. And so if you're finding that you're not being natural, it's important to first understand in what ways you're not being natural um, and really look at being um, coming out with smaller pieces of you slowly so that people can um, get a taste of you and get comfortable with your thoughts and then slowly show more and more of who you are. It's 
vital that you don't spend a lot of your working time adapting. It's energetically ex- exhausting and puts you in a position to be more testy um, it, later, right? Because we're like a, a, a teapot. We build up the pressure, we build up the pressure, and then we pop. And so you want to be able to release the pressure a little bit over time so that you don't build up. Tony, I hope that helps you. And I would be really interested to see, hear specifically what's happening in your workplace and see if any of this uh, helps you. So please comment and let me know. I believe we have a question on the line. Hello. Hi, Laura. Hi. Um, so my question for you involves uh, procrastination. And what can I do when I'm in this lull of non-productivity? And what's going to get me to motivate myself um, to start working in the way that I need to? Fantastic. What a great question. Okay. So you're procrastinating. What are you procrastinating on? It could be daily work, chores, mostly things that I I don't want to do. Ah, so there's the key, right? Those are the things that you don't want to do. So what um, if pick one of the items that you don't like to do. We'll work. We'll work through that one. Hmm. Textbook reading. Textbook reading. Okay. And so what is it that you don't like about textbook reading? I don't, I don't find it very interesting. Boring. Uh, you find it boring. Okay. What subject are you reading? Um, AP um, American History. Okay. So when we're doing something that's boring and we've got to keep ourselves motivated, we've got to look at what benefit can you find in reading the textbook? What is the benefit for you? Um, It will definitely help me in class, answering questions, and long-term for tests. Okay. And so can you think about one way that you could make the reading less boring? Reading it aloud sometimes helps, or with an audio. Sometimes I'll have audio of the textbook versions, and I can read along with it. Awesome. So it sounds like you have a couple of really good resources that you use now for getting through the task. Yeah. So that's fantastic that you're already doing this. If you look at, I know you said you um, something you didn't like to do was chores. If you look at doing chores, how can you apply your resourcefulness in getting through your textbook reading to something like your chores? I guess just approaching the chore as um, the faster I get it done, the longer I can study or do something productive. Okay. So that's a great, great idea. Is that enough to get you motivated to go? Hmm. Maybe. I don't know. So what about um, self-rewards when you are getting something boring like chores done have you thought about those that's great so that might try trying to find ways to make it fun you know um it could be like i said you know coming up with some um rewards for doing it it could be listening to music while you do it do you like music yeah yeah so finding ways to make something that's a task that you don't enjoy more fun could be a way to get through this, just like you found great ways to get through your AP history reading. Yeah, that's great. You've already got a great start. I'm super excited to talk to you. Yes, thank you so much. Thanks so much for calling in. Good luck. Keep me posted. Thank you. That was a great call. I'm so happy to help young people who are looking at ways to stay, you know, within what's natural, to stay motivated. Great questions. Okay. Um, I think I have time for a couple of more questions I have here. Um, Chris from, let's see, where Chris from Fairfield says, um, what do you do when you lose respect for your manager and it impacts your motivation to do the work? This is such an important question um, because I know that for a lot of individuals we saw, you know, um, 
a large percentage of individuals are people oriented. And so when we're looking at our managers, we are looking to have people that we respect and want to work for. One of the things that's going to be really important is to decide your integrity around your own work ethic um, and find other reasons for motivation. You know, what can you learn from the situation that will help you be a better manager, that will help you um, work with people better? Um, It's also looking at what can you get out of the work that's separate from your manager. Creating that separation between the work and the manager is going to be really important to regain the motivation to do a good job. Um, And again, I'm going to come back to that integrity with how you do your own work. I think once we decide how we want to show up and we look at our standards and expectations of ourselves, it gives us a place to um, monitor and measure how we're doing, not related to something external like a manager. So, Chris, I hope that helps you out. Thank you so much for joining me. As always, I love hearing your thoughts and getting your feedback on the show. Please remember to visit the Own Your Truth with Laura T. Facebook page and comment. This is Laura T. on Own Your Truth. I'll hear you then. Good night.